international politics, Spider-Man, and the kid on your sunscreen bottle. From American Public Media, this is Marketplace. It's Tuesday, the 4th of July. Happy Independence Day, everyone. I'm Adrian Hill in for Kai Rizdahl. North Korea says it successfully tested an intercontinental ballistic missile for the first time, upping the ante in an already tense standoff. Russia and China want a cooling down. Government officials from those countries have proposed a moratorium on North Korean nuclear and missile tests and are asking the U.S. and South Korea to hold off on any large-scale military exercises. Even before this test, North Korea and reining in its weapons program was going to be a big part of the discussion at the upcoming G20 meeting. For more, we've got Marketplace's Adam Allington with us. Adam, thanks for being here. Happy to be here. What's expected to be the conversation at the G20 later this week? How much is North Korea and their missile test today going to be a part of that conversation? Well, for starters, it's worth noting that the president was, big surprise, already tweeting about North Korea's launch earlier this morning. He talked about how Japan and South Korea might take some kind of action. He even raised the possibility that China might take what he called a heavy move against North Korea. The U.S., South Korea, and Japan were already scheduled for a sit-down to talk about North Korea, as well as a renegotiation of South Korea's trade relationship with the U.S. That's likely put on the back burner for now. Are there still economic buttons or levers to push in our dealings with North Korea? I put that very question to Patrick Cronin, director of the Asia-Pacific Security Program at the Center for a New America Security. There are economic incentives and disincentives that would be put into place, and I'm sure this will be a G20 agenda item on how to maximize economic pressure but also economic incentive without rewarding bad behavior from North Korea. It sounds to me a lot like a a stick-and-carrot approach here. The U.N. Security Council has already imposed significant sanctions on North Korea. What more could they do? What would that look like? Yeah, in terms of trade, North Korea has very little connections with the rest of the world. China's really North Korea's sole trading partner, so any economic pressure would have to come from China. Patrick Cronin says this could take the form of some kind of penalty or sanction for Chinese banks doing business with North Korea watershed, and it could go either way, whether it's going to go toward heavy secondary sanctions and making sure that China actually closes down its important economic interaction with North Korea, or it could go the other direction. What's the other direction here, Adam? What's that look like? Yeah, that other direction Cronin was referring to would be something like a de-escalation plan, something similar to what China and Russia are proposing now, something that would bring the parties back to the negotiation table to work out a deal and possibly lift sanctions. If that doesn't happen, what are the broader implications for the global economy here? Well, one concern is of a potential deterioration of the U.S.-China trading relationship. That is, if China doesn't get on board with accelerating secondary sanctions on Chinese banks doing business with North Korea, that could lead to some kind of breakdown in its relationship with the U.S., which would have all kinds of other economic ripple effects. Also, and this is a worst-case scenario, but any kind of preemptive military strike or action to take out North Korea's nuclear program would be bad for markets, and that goes without saying. Marketplace's Adam Allington from Washington, D.C. Thanks so much. Thank you, Adrian. Climate change and the Paris Agreement will also be a key discussion point at this week's G20 meeting, which could make things a bit awkward for President Trump. He's already had a few stumbles in previous meetings with world leaders. Broadly, according to a new survey, international public opinion of the U.S. has recently taken a hit. Marketplace's Mitchell Hartman reports. The Pew Research Center recently polled residents of major U.S. allies and trading partners in Europe, Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East. Confidence in the U.S. president to do the right thing in international affairs has fallen by two-thirds compared to the last years of the Obama presidency to just 22 percent. Only in Russia and Israel did Trump's rating beat Obama's. Pew senior researcher Jacob Poster says several policies are particularly unpopular abroad. Building a wall between the U.S. and Mexico, withdrawing support for major trade agreements, and withdrawing support from international climate agreements. The Pew survey finds that international opinion of the U.S. overall has deteriorated since the election, but not of Americans and American popular culture. 
Brand USA gets a thumbs up from well over half of respondents. Jacob Kierkegaard at the Peterson Institute for International Economics isn't a bit surprised. It's a brand that radiates youth, innovation, drive for more personal freedom, satisfaction, elements of the modern economy that is just quintessential American. The Internet, Facebook, Google. Also, disruption of the old way of doing things. And here, brand Trump is landing just the way the president wants, says Corey Dade at PR firm Burson Marsteller in Washington, D.C. Well, President Trump certainly has been willing to break some glass, upset the status quo in order to get his agenda advanced. And in order to do that, you have to be willing to upset some people. Dade says a major challenge for the administration will be getting close allies that the president has upset to stand shoulder to shoulder with the U.S. on common threats like North Korea and global cyber attacks. I'm Mitchell Hartman for Marketplace. U.S. markets were closed today for the 4th of July holiday, but we've still got some red, white, and blue stats for you. We'll have the details when we do the numbers. Many Syrian refugees who come to the United States are resettled in cities that get federal funding, funding meant to help them start their new lives here. But sometimes they move out of those cities. And when they relocate to parts of the country that aren't part of the federal program, it can be a juggling act. Alice Daniel reports from Fresno, California. Layla Darwish looks up from the sidewalk and greets a Syrian woman waving down from her second floor apartment. Darwish works part-time for Fresno Interdenominational Refugee Ministries, or FIRM. But she pretty much spends all her waking hours helping Syrians who have just moved to Fresno. Like Mohammed Bashan, who lives in one of the apartments here with his wife and five kids. The family came to the U.S. after fleeing Syria and then living in a refugee camp in Jordan. Bashan says he came to Fresno because of the large and welcoming Arab-American community. But he was still worried. When refugees leave a resettlement area like San Diego, or in Bashan's case, Turlock, the resources don't travel with them. Darwish interprets for him. Because they didn't know where to start or where to begin. And in the beginning, there was a local mosque that helped them just network with people. And then once firm came in, we started taking them to the DMV to get their permits, their driving uh, lessons. A few decades ago, Hmong refugees from Laos crammed into this cluster of low-rent apartment complexes. The apartments run about $450 for a two-bedroom unit. But there are drawbacks. Rental deposits are high, says Darwish. Because they don't have a credit history and because they don't have um, a rental agreement history, they have to pay anywhere from like six to 900 deposit, double. And the area isn't always safe. There have been a number of attacks from the neighborhood gangs, um, from anywhere from throwing stones, um, knives. The police have been called lately. Firm director Zach Dara says he's partnering with local Islamic cultural centers, churches, and advocacy groups to help Syrians find better housing. He also relies on donations. The dollars are are very challenging, you know, and it's also because it's a polarizing issue. I've spoken at places that blatantly do not agree with the work that we're doing. About 200 Syrians have migrated on their own to Fresno, most in the past year. Some have found jobs in a local chicken processing plant. Dara expects more refugees. I've gotten calls from Indiana, from Florida, from Texas. There are lots of volunteers to help. People have donated cars and their time, like Kathleen Shavor Bergen. She's part of Fresno's large Armenian community. Her grandparents fled to Aleppo, Syria, during the genocide. Now, she regularly visits and cooks meals with several Syrian families. It's really the least I can do. Um, they opened their arms to my, my family, and now I'm opening my arms to theirs. 
There's been enough of a migration here that the International Rescue Committee was considering Fresno as a future resettlement city. But that was before President Trump's travel ban put the refugee program on hold. In Fresno, I'm Alice Daniel for Marketplace. Brazilian politics has recently been full of drama. Massive corruption scandals, the impeachment of the former president, and now the current president has been charged with taking bribes. So how are Brazilians holding up? The BBC's South America correspondent Katie Watson reports from Rio de Janeiro. A week is a long time in Brazilian politics. By the end of it, there was lots of noise. There were peaceful calls for the president to go. There were also standoffs between protesters and police. The week started badly for the president after he was charged with accepting bribes. Nearly two months of investigations painted Mr. Temer as a corrupt leader entrenched in dirty politics. O Brasil está caminhando. But as ever, he's not giving up, blaming people for trying to stop Brazil moving forward. He said they would never succeed. But last week, there was a hitch. The federal police stopped issuing passports because of a budget crisis. Brazil's Mint is trying to keep production going. There's one huge room in the Brazilian Mint, and this is where all of the passports for Brazil are made. Workers here are are making sure that they can make as many passports as possible so that they can then be taken to the federal police when they're given the OK. Lara Amorelli is a woman in charge of printing passports at Brazil's Mint. She says they're just waiting for the nod to get back to work. Now it's a Congress issue. The police department and the justice uh, ministry, they are already asked for more budget. And then there is an internal process of our Congress to get this approved. They are working also to do this as fast as possible. Michel Temer has few fans among Brazilian people, but despite the low approval ratings, despite the protests, despite the criminal charges against him, he's still hanging on. Because what's the alternative? I went down to Copacabana Beach in Rio to speak to some Brazilians, but they seem to be running out of ideas. It's not working. That's the problem. And we don't know what to do about the politics this moment. We just put one president out, and the second is having the same problem now. And... We lost. So you've given up? Not, not giving up, just trying to find strength somewhere to keep going. I don't know about other people, but I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I no longer follow politics. I can't stomach it. These are unprecedented times. Michel Temer is the first sitting president to face charges, but experts say little will change. Marcus Trojo is a professor at Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. Right now, it is as if time is frozen in Brazil, and everyone is just counting the clock to see when we're going to be able to overcome this. And I think the only way to do it, really, is to wait for the October 2018 elections, where really we're going to draw the line between past and present. That was the BBC's Katie Watson. Coming up? It was tough and strange. We felt dirty. But it paid the bills. The business of the new Spider-Man movie. Straight ahead. But first, let's do the numbers. It's Independence Day. Been 241 years since the 13 colonies declared themselves free from British rule. The 4th of July has been a paid legal federal holiday since 1938. 
That means U.S. markets are closed today. Foreign markets were down slightly. If you got some spare time to read, you might pick up a pocket edition of the U.S. Constitution. It's a dollar over on Amazon, or maybe the 1852 Frederick Douglass speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. That'll run you five bucks. Perhaps some poems by Emma Lazarus. She wrote that one about America welcoming your tired, your poor, your huddled masses. A collection of her work is five fifty. You're listening to Marketplace. This Marketplace podcast is brought to you by the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. There are many truisms we see play out in life each and every day. You get out what you put in. Some will lead while others follow. Both are especially true in the business world, and even more so in the automotive world, especially on Planet M. Michigan is number one in automotive research and development, and home to 81 global auto suppliers, North American headquarters, and tech centers. It has the greatest concentration of skilled engineering talent in the world. Michigan is also one of the nation's first proving grounds for the testing, demonstration, and deployment of connected autonomous vehicles. Add all this up, and it's easy to see that Michigan is the true epicenter for the future of transportation mobility. To learn more, head to michiganbusiness.org slash planet M. Planet M, where big ideas and mobility are born. This is Marketplace. I'm Adrian Hill. We're going to take a few minutes here for our seasonal series about the people and products who make summer what it is in America. Today's installment is from a woman you've probably seen countless times when you put on sunscreen, maybe for a day at the beach or by the pool. It's the latest installment of what we call Summer Brought to You By. Imagination. Wonderful products. Brought to you by... I'm Sherry Irwin, and I'm the baby that modeled for the Coppertone logo trademark. My whole family was centered around my mother being an artist. Um, she, she was in a, a circle of artists in Chicago when all the pinup artwork was done post-World War II, and they had all the little girly girls you know, caught in a situation with their skirt blowing up or something going on. But Mom was one of the top five pinup artists. There weren't a lot of women that survived full-time as an artist from the, and worked from home back in the 50s. She was uh, very much a maverick in that sense. She had the capability to cross venues so easily and do beautiful oil paintings and then translate over to pinup artwork and then into commercial drawings. She just loved to draw or paint or, or create. She did hundreds of billboards, literally hundreds of billboards, and got the assignment to uh, create a, a baby playing on a beach. So she came up with the rendering of the Coppertone ad that you see today, which is the baby and the dog playing on the beach with the tan line being exposed. And I'm the baby. It was just one of many that I did, and I think I, it was probably going into high school is a good time to say I was more aware of the word getting out, that that was me, or, you know, my mother was involved and that was me. So, uh, and then, of course, high school, you know how it is. <laughs> yeah, they have to make fun of it. And, you know, I got all the comments, turn around, prove it, or turn the other cheek. People can't resist. Make the most of moments in the sun. Pop the tone makes living in the sunshine fun. It gives the fastest energy. as you That was Sherry Irwin, the original Copper Tone girl. So don't you be a pale face, get that sun. Get yourself some Copper Tone, it's number one. Get the fastest tan that anyone can. Tan don't burn, get a Copper Tone. There'll be another big budget comic book movie in theaters this weekend. Spider-Man Homecoming. The estimated $175 million movie features a new Spidey, played by actor Tom Holland. This Peter Parker is younger. And the story is way more Ferris Bueller than Dark Knight. So to become an Avenger, are there like trials or an interview? Do me a favor. Can't you just be a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man? Just stay close to the ground. You're the Spider-Man from YouTube. It's the take of two of the writers credited on the film, Jonathan Goldstein and John Francis Daly. They join me now. Thanks for coming on the show, guys. Thanks, Thanks for, for having, having us. us yeah. Yeah. So first question, John, why do we need a new Spider-Man movie? Why? Well, <laughs> because uh, 
we, there has been an appetite for a different kind of superhero, and that even pertains to the earlier versions of Spider-Man that people have seen. Unlike every other superhero that you see, this is one that is insecure, uh, very much a teenager with all the angst that comes with it, and they just want to belong. And he doesn't figure everything out by the second act and become a brooding adult who has, you know, the weight of the world on his shoulders. He's still a kid, and he wants to take advantage of the fact that he has superpowers. This was the first Marvel movie that kind of had to justify its existence in a way. Up till now, they were usually breaking new ground, putting new actors in the roles. This was one that's been done five times before Mm -hmm. in two different incarnations. And so we came in feeling that sense of like, okay, how can we reinvent this? What have we seen? Let's make a checklist of all the things you've seen in all the other movies, and let's not do those. Let's not have him swing by web through Manhattan. There's yeah. not a scene in this movie where that happens. Let's not have him uh, sit at the top of the Empire State Building thinking about how hard his life is. And let's not do Uncle Ben's death again because everybody knows, yes, it's a sad backstory, but we don't have to revisit it. What was it like for you guys to sort of think back to your teenage angsty years? Or were you perfectly cool and we're amazing? Always in touch. We're always in touch with that <laughs> angst. It runs through everything. Yeah, it's ne- we've work. never grown out of it. Uh, well, personally, I, I was I was on a show uh, called Freaks and Geeks that very much dealt with teen angst, um, and I was I was living uh, through my character uh, the angst that I I felt uh, growing up, and and also being the youngest cast member on the show, and and what you know how that made me an outcast even in the context of the high school show that I was filming. So I could certainly tap into that, and and I still feel it now. Um, and I know it was similar for Jonathan, who was also on Freaks and Geeks. No, I was not. I wish I was. I noticed there are six credited writers on the movie. How did that work? <laughs> I mean, it's very, it's very much uh, in, on par with, with how Marvel operates a lot of the time. Uh, there are so many moving parts, and, uh, and there's such a, a rush to get these, these movies produced because they, they slate them before they even make them. So they, they know when the movie's coming out, and it's just a race to the finish line. What is the timing of something like this, Jonathan? Talk me through the the sort of the race to the finish line. Um, well, we came on what was it two years ago? Mm-hmm. Almost exactly two years ago, and um, and no script at that point. Nothing. No, nothing. Nothing but some ideas, and uh, and then we spent. We got the job. We spent about six weeks in a room with Marvel executives and the director. They're already um, guys working on what they call previs, which is uh, people sitting at computers basically and doing CG mock-ups of what scenes will be like, even before we've written them to wow. some extent. They know we're going to have a scene in a cargo plane. So they start so they're coming working up with, on the airplane. Yeah. It's a, collab- it's, it's a hugely collaborative yeah. effort. So if you, if you go into a thing like it's going to be my baby, you're going to be disappointed because <laughs> yeah. it's not going to be 100% anyone's baby. There's just too many moving parts. Something else interesting about this project is you have two studios involved here. You mm-hmm. have Sony, you have Marvel, owned by Disney. How did that factor in, John, in, in, into the process itself? It was a very copacetic relationship between the two of them. I know, you know, Sony had owned Spider-Man wholly uh, up until this moment, and uh, they knew that it, it had to change just fundamentally. And Marvel had proven themselves as being really good they at... They know how to do the comic oh book God, movie. Yeah, I mean, no one's better than them. And they, and they know also what audiences want and what audiences are tired of. Sony had to relent and just kind of let them do their own thing, which I think ultimately uh, helped. Now, were you guys noted to death, Jonathan, though, just because there were so many executives involved here? There was a lot of, there was, like I said, collaborative process. <laughs> um, A.K.A. noted to death. Noted to death. <laughs> um yeah, I think that, you know, everybody has pretty specific ideas of what they hope it will be. Um, there's a lot of cooks, and you're trying to please a lot of different uh, kind of bosses. And do you guys have to think about merchandising, too, as you're writing this? Is that something that, that's a piece of this because it's such an important part of the money side of are this? Are you calling us sellouts? What do you mean? <laughs> this, is an art, this is a work of art. Uh, we are on Marketplace right now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you knew it was coming. Exactly. Uh, yes, and it, and it's and it can be difficult to figure out a way to incorporate said merchandise into the into the product without it feeling you know shilly. Sometimes it's easy, like the Audi. 
the they Audi. Wanted, they yeah. wanted the bully, the rich bully in school to That's be right. driving an Audi, whatever. And there's like done and yeah. done. We right. knew we needed a sports car. <laughs> we didn't so get anything was, for that. No, but. oh no, no, no. Maybe we will from this interview. Uh, but no, there was. There, I, I won't get into specifics of it because I don't know, you know, how much uh, I can say. But there was a product that a company wanted to uh, endorse through the through the movie that would be a toy. And we were asked if there was a way to incorporate that toy in very naturally as like a, a, a gadget that, that Peter Parker used. And uh, it was it was tough and strange. We felt dirty. <laughs> Did you we do it? Dirty. Did we? Uh, I think we said no. I think yeah, we were like, we well, held the line. And then they had the next it. writer do it. Oh, exactly. <laughs> so it will still be yeah. there, but we don't I, have to blame you guys for so. it. I think so. Yeah, yeah, very much. <laughs> Jonathan Goldstein and John Francis Daly, co-writers on Spider-Man Homecoming. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. One final note before we go today. This from the Thomas Jefferson Encyclopedia. Turns out Jefferson, drafter of the Declaration of Independence, is also credited as having written the first known American ice cream recipe. It called for two bottles of good cream, six egg yolks, a half a pound of sugar, and a stick of vanilla. Count me in. Markets were closed today for the July 4th holiday. Tommy Andres is the producer on our special projects desk. Caitlin Esch is the producer on our Wealth and Poverty desk. Our digital team includes Ben Hethcote, Sarah Menendez, Donna Tam, and Tony Wagner. I'm Adrian Hill. Happy 4th of July. This is APM.